Good afternoon. I am Ukjun Yu, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, session. Throughout the life cycle, when uh, we assess toxicity of uh, pharmaceuticals, the scope is very wide, and it would be difficult to cover everything within 90 minutes but i try i will try my best to share as much uh, details as possible this is the history of ich guideline s5 please refer to uh, that later this is the table of contents the same um, table of contents from the revised i um, ch guideline In the third um, revised version, these are main updates. First, ICH M3, S3, S6, S9, and S11 um, are related guidelines. And it it elaborates on the use of exposure margins in dose level selection. The um, reproduction toxicity test, test is done after phase one. So the exposure uh, level, the exposure margin is already known. It's compared against uh, the exposure margin for the animal. So um, the standard uh, for the dose level selection is provided. Addition of new information is about how to incorporate a section, uh, how to uh, include the risk assessment for human uh, risk assessment. And alternative essays can replace in vivo test. So more details are added on that. And in phase two, when um, there are more than 150 of women in uh, childbearing age, the development toxicity tests must be included, but there are um, exceptions which does not require this, and these are explained in the latter part. DART studies, its objective. Here we are talking about toxicity tests for pharmaceuticals. So the aim of the ART studies is to reveal effect of the pharmaceutical on the life cycle. There are three uh, categories. First, from gonadotogenesis until implantation and during pregnancy, embryo fetus development and after birth, the lactation period and growth and development. So these are three uh, parts. So please uh, refer to the diagram as you read through the related literature. When a pharmaceutical development is done, when uh, do we do the reproduction toxicity test, phase two, phase three, separately? So for each phase, which reprotoxicity test must be included is a question that is included in the guideline. But finally, which test must be carried out at the final stage? That must be determined by the um, tester. Details are explained in the guidelines, so uh, you can follow the guideline for test. I will get back to this point later.
this guideline applies to pharmaceuticals, including combination products. But the new uh, ones include biopharmaceuticals and vaccines and novel excipients that are part of the final pharmaceutical product. So these are included, but this uh, new guideline does not apply to cellular therapies, gene therapies, and tissue engineered products. This guideline should be read in conjunction with ICHM3, ICHS6, and ICHS9 regarding whether and when non-clinical DART um, studies are warranted. To plan um, DART, what are the general cons considerations? In order to understand how to do the test, we need to understand different types of DART. This is a separate slide explaining that. From gametogenesis, give, giving birth, growth, and gametogenesis. This is a reproductive cycle. When drugs are developed for each stage, we need to understand its impact. It, is, it takes a long time to check that at every stage. And drug products are used for a certain period. Patients are not exposed throughout the um, life cycle. For chemical components, we have a testing method for lifelong exposure. But pharmaceutical products, the exposure is only for the treatment period. So out of 80 to 90 years, only a certain time, um, during certain time, there is an exposure. So instead of having a life cycle assessment, um, it's better to focus on reproductive cycle and have sub-segments. Uh, so there are three sub-segments within reproductive cycle. The first um, is fertility and early embryonic development. Segment one is to check whether um, contraception is done before mating the material is induced, and once the implementation is done, that means it's concepted. So uh, up until conception, uh, it's segment one. And segment two is to check whether there is a um, development in embryo fetal stage. Development in this context includes any growth or development. After a baby is born and when um, they grow, it's called development. And the fetus uh, inside the womb of a mother, uh, it is referred to as development. So we use embryo of fetal development. development. Segment two study is for the baby inside the womb to check whether the development is done. And segment three is after birth, pre and postnatal developmental toxicity study. For segment three, the test um, articles are induced during pregnancy because during pregnancy, when there is an exposure to a certain chemical after birth, sometimes babies uh, are do not grow um, well. So the test uh, materials are induced during pregnancy to a mother and see how um, the child um, development is done. 
it is induced before um, birth. So that's why it's called the pre- and postnatal developmental toxicity study. After birth, uh, the same is true for human, and it's the same for animal. When mother takes good care of uh, babies, they can grow well. So mother's care, in a scientific sense, called um, mother's capability of uh, growing and taking care of a child. So that concept is also included in PPND. So there are segment one, two, and three um, segments. It's called three study design. So based up on this understanding, uh, you can more easily follow the rest of the lecture. Segment one study is for for pre-mating period first. It's given to male for a certain period. For female, uh, two weeks prior to mating. And then mating is done. And then conception and um, the uh, administration is finished after six days. For segment uh, test, uh, red is used. On the uh, day six, implantation is finished. So um, it is given until day six. And whether implementation is done correctly or not, we cannot check it uh, immediately. We have to wait until the fetus uh, develops. And day 14 and uh, 15, we do the ne necropsy to see whether the implantation is done accurately. And for male, um, it is given during mating period. And then a necropsy is done to see uh, to have sperm analysis and also um, tissue analysis and pathological analysis. Next, segment two, EFD. For rat, pregnant day six to 17. For rabbit, day seven to 19. For rabbit, sometimes day six to 18 is applied. But in most cases, in most laboratories for rabbit, GD7 to 19 is the period when um, the material is given. The feed um, amount and weight change are recorded. And GD29 rabbit um, ne necropsy to see the growth of the baby. Uh, GD21 for red and GD29 for rabbit. That's the necropsy uh, timing. After the necropsy, we take out the fetus and check the appearance, external um, check and skeletal check, whether the development is done in a normal way, and visceral test, heart, kidney, lung, and other organs, whether they developed um, well. So this is segment two test. Pre and postnatal developmental toxicity study, segment three study. GD6 is the starting point, giving birth. And for RET, after 21st days of the giving birth, uh, meaning is done. So right. Uh, up to that point, uh, the material is given, and on that day, um, mother is killed. After birth, after a while, baby starts um, turning around, and the teeth start coming out. It's the same for animal. At a certain stage, uh, they start uh, teething, uh, they start uh, flipping. And these tests 
are done so that the newborn to see whether the newborns grow well and after mating we check whether their reproductive uh, functions work correctly and that's the end of the study and that's the end of the segment three this is for the second generation newborn animals the growth index and behavioral index test items if you are involved in such a test or if you need to um, contract out these uh, tests uh, then you can study the details i won't go into details about each and every test item the test uh, equipment and this is a rotating plate animal is put on top and they um, stick around this is about balancing and movement and this one is for a traction test animal um, is hanging here and it climbs up if it uh, manages to climb up then the forearms are um, normal and for this testing the animal is placed within the cage at first they feel so frightened so they cannot adapt to the environment and try to get out of it. So they just rotate within the cage. And once they are adapted to the situation, they are relieved. Then they move to the center of the cage. So it is to see whether the animal uh, can adapt to the environmental changes. So by conducting this kind of a testing, we can see whether the uh, these animals are well developing or not. So there are many different types of the DART testing. So we have segment one and two and three. And there are things to consider when we conduct the testing, and this is stipulated in the guideline for. DART testing, if you think about the targeted pa pa uh, patient population, if they cannot be conceived like the pediatric po uh, population or juvenile population, then DART testing doesn't have to be done. Sometimes the patient population have serious disease so that they cannot be conceived and there is no need to conduct the DART testing. And let's say if the ROA is oral for the clinical trial, then here should be it should be the same ROA. And there are many different types of the toxicity testing done before the uh, the ART testing design. So those data need to be considered in designing the DART trial. And for a specific product, there can be some targeted, the target protein. And then we have to understand the general biology and pharmacology of that target before conducting DART testing. So these things need to be considered before conducting DART testing or the DART testing. So when it comes to the patient uh, population, the target population, as I said, for example, let's say the uh, product is to treat the postmenopausal female patient population, then the DART is not required. And 
the pharmacological consideration is also important. Let's say if the intended pharmacologic effect of the product are known to be incompatible with the uh, fertility or induce early birth, then it is not possible to observe the parturition and therefore PPND as usual uh, cannot gather any appropriate data. So PPND need to be modified to that. So let's say if the intended pharmacologic effects of the product is related or impede the ovulation, then there is no need to look at the fertility or uh, fertility testing. And as for the toxicity consideration, Usually, the DART testing is done after phase one. So repeated dose toxicity study results in PK profile and pharmacological actions are already known. So these things need to be considered in designing the study. And as I said, there are set one, two, three uh, different uh, types of the study. So of that, which one need to be conducted? should be decided. And that decision can be made based on the other guidelines. And I will uh, talk about it later. For TK, the data, the TK data can be used to design the study. And I will explain further on that matter later on. Once the animal is conceived compared to non-conceived animal, their PK parameters uh, naturally change. So particularly for the EFD toxicity study, TK parameters need to be considered generally. And for this, the pharmaceuticals concentration in the embryo or fetus need to be checked. And this is more useful when the development hazard is not clear or discordant. However, the pharmaceuticals concentration in the embryo or fetus may not be conducted, uh, may not be checked or not. It, it's, uh, depends on the case by case. And for the in vivo study, how do we design and evaluate the in vivo studies? For NHP DART testing, I will talk about it later on. But usually, we do have three study designs, segment one and two and three. And this is appropriate design. If we have to reduce the number of the animals, or if the candidate substance has no toxicity, then segment one and two, they can be combined into one. So that, that is a way. And general toxicity and DART, DART testing can be combined, and these can be done. And I will talk about it later. For FEED, as I said, there is a reproductive cycle and steps, and which step uh, need to be assessed will be decided by the sponsor. However, there are very detailed instructions from the guidelines, so we can base that decision. Uh, we can make the decision based on the guideline. Segment one study, as I explained, stage one is the gametogenesis, and stage B is the early uh, 
embryonic development. So usually the rodents is used. And what is important here is that in the segment one study, we can go for with only males or only females, or we can go for both sexes and they can be mated later on, then look at the result. So when we can use males only and then mate them with the females which were not used or which were not participated in the clinic, the, in the trial, or vice versa. These kind of the things need to be decided. So in that case, for the fertility, if we expect that there will be no adverse effect in fertility, Usually, we conduct the general toxicity testing before the DART testing. So with the general toxicity testing, we see no AE on organs, general organs. Then we can expect that there will be no adverse effect on the fatality. Then it, in that case, we can use both sexes and then mate them. And then that would constitute the segment one. But when it comes to mode of action or repeat dose toxicity testing result show that there is a histological changes or uh, adverse effect, effect to the reproductive organs, then that can affect on the fertility. If that is the case, we can put only males or females into the design. So we conduct the DART testing on males only and on females only. We can separate them. That is what the guideline says. And what is important is that we conducted the FEED and see, uh, observe that uh, there is an impact. So in that case, we have to look at the reversibility of AE. If that is the case, we have to have a separate arm to see the reversibility. The regulators take this very important. So if there is an impact, adverse impact on the uh, fertility, then we have to see the reversibility of AE. And when we design the segmental studies, we often miss that many just to conduct the monitoring of astronauts' cyclicity until a certain period. However, they should be monitored through the time of confirmation of mating. So this is important. And for biologics or biopharmaceuticals, there are some other considerations. Let's say we have developed bio biopharmaceuticals and it have a pharmacological activity in rodents or rabbits. Then we can conduct the testing with rats or ma uh, mouse. But if there is no pharmacological activity in rodents or the rabbit, if that is the case, we have to use DOG or NA, NHP. But the thing is, depending on the season, DOGs may be conceived or not. For NHP, there is no seasonal differences. But for NHP, basically the fertility is not that strong. People, human, uh, fertility is lesser than 50%, which is true, also true for NHP, for example, monkey. If we use monkey in fertility testing, then let's say we have the low fertility, we cannot be sure whether it is because of a certain pharma uh, biopharmaceutical products or it's only because it is NHP. 
So for biopharmaceuticals, what we can do is that when we conduct a repeated dose toxicity testing, we conduct the testing with adult. And then after nephropsy, we conduct the histological uh, evaluation on the reproductive organs in order to see if there is any issues or not. If that is the case, if that is done, then the fertility assessment for the NHP is not required. For the segment two study, EFD, as explained whether the fetus within the womb is well developing or not. So stage C and stage D will be assessed. And generally, one species of rodents and one species of non-rodents are used. And hazard identification and risk assessment are the terms that repeatedly appear in the guideline. Hazard identification is that is to see uh, wh what kind of toxicity is there uh, with the product under development. When the product is injected into or administered into the animal, whether it causes toxicity in liver, kidney, or heart. So, you know, uh, assessing that is the hazard identification. Meanwhile, risk assessment is about, let's say, the animal study show that it is safe at 10 mg per kg then we have to understand and identify at what dosage it is safe for human. That's the risk assessment. So hazard identification should precede the risk assessment. And that will be explained in more detail later on. So we have now developed a uh, product but we do not have relevant animal species, then off-target effect is something that the, the draw causes hazardous effect on non-target. And that should be checked. So even if we do not have the relevant animal species, we have to check whether that occurs or not. That's why we have to have the EFD testing, even for the case where we do not have the relevant animal species. And in conducting EFD, it is important to understand those range finding and preliminary and definitive. These are the terms or the different types of the studies falling into the EFD. The first is the dose range finding EFD study. In order to conduct a definitive EFD, we need to set the dose, and that's what those range finding uh, study does. And preliminary EFD or PEFD study is different from the dose range finding EFD study. These are two different studies. So what is different is that those range finding study is usually utilized six animals per group. Although the animals are mated, that does not mean that every of them will be conceived. So usually the conceived animal, the number of the conceived animals will be smaller than the six per each group. For a preliminary EFD, the minimum of six pregnant females per group is used. 
and there is no staining of the skeletons or visceral assessment. So that's the difference. For preliminary EFD, actually the method itself is quite identical to the definitive study, but the number of the animals tested are different and the skeletal, uh, skeletal assessment is not conducted. And the difference from the dose range finding study here is that six, at least the six pregnant females per gram need to be used. That means that we have to start with larger number or higher number, which means usually eight animals per each group. For definitive study, at least the 16 to 20 pregnant females per group, the general conditions, weight and feed consumption, and uh, skeletal and also visceral examinations are done. So here, as a summary, the number of the uh, females per group is different and the items for testing are different. And when you develop the protocol for the EFD, you have to remember that sometimes we have to use only one species. Space. It is the case where in MRHD, if the malformulation or embryo fetal literacy uh, can be observed, then one species is okay for risk assessment. However, if malformation or embryo fetal literacy is observed in higher than MRHD, then we go for two species, right? one rodent and one non-rodent. For one non-rodent, it can be rats. And if it's okay to have one uh, species, that would be this case. And for the indefinitive EFD study, sometimes there are some conditions where alternative toxicity study can be done and without definitive EFD study. And I will explain it later and further. And I already talked about hazard identification, hazard assessment, exposure assessment, and risk assessment. I explained some of those terms already. And I explained hazard identification, which toxicity is observed at which dosage, and for the hazard assessment, from the non-clinical test result or study results, We have to decide Noel for human study in rabbit or in red. These kind of toxicities were found, and of that, we have to have human study later on, and we have to decide a dosage that will not deliver toxic effect to human participants. So we have to decide it. An exposure assessment is to understand and assess how much hazardous materials is exposed. So we compare hazard assessment and exposure assessment result in order to do the risk assessment. 
So here we can see hazard assessment results and exposure assessment results. We compare them so that we can set the use of uh, exposure margins in those level selection. So we have to understand these first so that we can better understand the guideline. The guideline talks a lot about hazard identification, hazard assessment, exposure assessment, and risk assessment. For EFD, uh, for biopharmaceuticals, if there is a, a pharmacological activity uh, for a species, then one for rodent and one for non rodent. And enhanced pre and postnatal development study uh, can be conducted replacing EFD study for non human primate or NHP if that is the only species, relevant species. And if there is no relevant species, surrogate molecule transgenic mo models can be considered. But this does not happen that much in reality. And you can read other blets on the slide on yourself. In designing EFD study, you have to also remember that we have to submit the data at the start of the phase two. But there is a way to delay or postpone the submission. And that is well explained in the guideline. In order to understand that way here, we have to understand when to submit the when to submit in order to have the approval for the DART testing. ICH guideline M3 clearly understand uh, clearly explains it. For segment one before phase three. The data should be submitted for, say, uh, facts segment three for the U.S. market before the submission of NDA, Korea before phase three. For segment two, it's a bit diff uh, complicated. This is this is needed for the phase two. If the phase two study is conducted in two weeks from the phase one, then it is waived. Within two weeks, conception cannot be occurring that easily. So if the time interval is only uh, within two weeks, then Segment two will be waived. And if there is a birth control and within three months, more than uh, within 150 subjects, then segment two preliminary test result will be submitted on two species. So here, this is preliminary test result. I already mentioned and explained the differences of those ranging and preliminary and definitive studies and their differences. So as I explained, there is a birth control within three months, 100, uh, less than 150 participants. Then the preliminary test result can be submitted. So in case of birth controls more than uh, three months, and more than 150 women of childbearing age, 
the definitive SEG2 segment 2 test results should be submitted. If there is no voice control, let's say if the drug to control nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, if that is the case, then all the data on the DART testing need to be submitted. And new addition here into the guideline is alternative approach. Adequately qualified alternative assay can be done, and this can replace in vivo testing, or submission can be delayed for each stage of clinical study. Let's say you have the study involving more than 150 participants or the subject. Then if you have this kind of approach, then you can delay the submission after the initiation of the phase three. So this one, the alternative one, will be explained further later on. And I said the submission can be delayed. In ICHM3, it says if the preliminary development or toxicity study result is submitted, then three lesser than three months and uh, lower than 150 subject clinical study can be done. But there are two more options. Let's say alternative toxicity testing on red. And there is another study for the preliminary study for rabbit. Then this can cover the non rodent and rodent testing. And I will explain it uh, later in more details. GLP preliminary study is done in one species and preliminary study on two species, if that is conducted, then at the phase two, more than 150 women of childbearing age, that kind of study can be done. I told you that the visceral study and if you include the skeleton study here, then it can be you can apply for this option. So in other words, the P preliminary EFT study is done in accordance with the GLP and per group more than six pregnant female and visceral skeletal studies are done, then definitive EFD study can be, you know, applied to this one because the audio items are done identically. And for the segment three study, usually rodents are used And for this study, EFD or general toxicity study results can be utilized. And beca because of that, the preliminary study is not needed. And if this product is for the adult population, but also for the pediatric population too, We need to identify the impact on the pediatric population. So we have to modify PPND so that we can understand the impact on the pediatric population. So when we conduct the uh, segment three study, 
we can conduct the toxicity study for the pediatric or juvenile pre-puberty population. And if the NAP is the only species which has the uh, pharmacological activity, then EPPND can be done. For NHP, usually takes three to four years to complete puberty. And it's not possible to conduct a study for that period of time. So if the NHP is the species used, then we just cannot see all the different stages in one study. For EFD, one rodent, one non rodent, rat and rabbit. And for vaccines or biopharmaceuticals, one species is acceptable. I will explain more about vaccine later on. So, rat for non rodent. So, rat rabbit and for vaccine and biopharmaceuticals bio one species for biological uh, uh, products for NHP antibiotic products so for antibiotic product NHP is selected for vaccine Animal species selected for testing of vaccines with uh, immune response. Red has immune response, so red um, is mainly used. So, like I just explained, please refer to the first uh, paragraph of the slide. Rabbit, red, and ma mice are mainly used. And if there is a immune response only from NHP, NHP is the only answer, but that is very, very a rare case. Disease models, genetically modified models, and surrogate molecules can be also used for study. And please read uh, the rest of the uh, sentence. Use of disease models, genetically modified models, this is not very common. It's a rare case. And I'll skip through the slides. Next, how to do those level selection. It's important and how to determine route of administration and um, how many times um, do we do the administration. Those selection. Those range finding study, preliminary study, and definitive study. The differences are already explained before. Please uh, remember that. I left this sentence uh, on purpose because it's important to understand the differences. In definitive study, when those range is um, found, you have to meet at least five uh, out of uh, five endpoints for high dosage. The rest two, you already know. When you do the dose selection, repeat those toxicity study, toxicokinetics, human exposure, and those uh, selection tests must be considered. The guideline explains that for high dose, the endpoint 
must be based on inducing a minimal level of toxicity in the parental animals at the high dose. The minimal toxicity is not found from a child. It's from a parent, mother. Then what is minimal toxicity? The guideline does not specifically explain what minimal toxicity is. So this is my personal um, opinion and definition. What is the minimal toxicity of a parental, uh, parental animal? Weight gain. If weight gain is more than 20% in high dose, this is not a minimal toxicity because the toxicity is too high. In this case, it's too, the high dose is too high. Now, the problem is in case of a rabbit, more than 20% of weight gain is not understood as high dose. For rabbit study, minimal toxicity of a uh, mother must be considered with the feed um, amount, how much feed um, the rabbit took. So for minimal toxicity, weight gain um, and the reduction of feed um, amount must be 10 to 15 percent. So for high dose, 85 to 90 gram, if the control um, is 100%, if the reduction is that much, the mean body weight is reduced by 5%. This is the minimum maternal toxicity, weight gain 10 to 15% and mean body weight 5% reduction. For red, weight gain 15% in selecting high dose. For rabbit, 20%. Then the high dose and minimal toxicity is set appropriate, appropriately. And that is uh, considered as an adverse effect. There are literatures and publications regarding minimal toxicity, and each has different minimal toxicity. But this could be an overarching definition to be applied in most cases. The guideline says when high dose is a uh, uh, determined based upon um, toxicity, weight change, temporal weight gain or reduction of mean body weight must not be used as a single criteria. From GD 6 to 17, the um, material is administered and the uh, weight gain throughout the whole period must be considered to be used as a criteria for setting high dose. Excessive sedation or hypoglycemia, which is quite abstract. Excessive sedation or hypoglycemia can be used for to uh, dose selection, high dose. Toxicity-based endpoint could be used and in that case, the weight gain and the feed um, consumption amount must be considered. Next, systemic exposure. Let's say we create a graph and the blood concentration of test article is vertical x and dose 
is horizontal x. When the test article concentration um, is uh, given, the concentration will go up. And once it reach to a certain stage, which is saturation point, no matter how much you give, the concentration remains the same. In this case, the this dose with when where saturation begins, this becomes high dose. So this is the second option, which is easier to understand. The saturation point becomes high dose. Next exposure to human um, and comparison. After phase one, we do DART and EFD. Human AUC or CMAX concentration is decided. AUC and CMAX of animal test is acquired from repeated dose toxicity test. And then we use multiples of that value, 25 fold. For example, if AUC to human is 10, to animal multiplied by 25. So 250 exposure uh, is set as high dose. Dosing and preliminary test for each dosing PK is done. Human AUC and CMAX of MRHD is compared and we can determine at which point there could be more than 25 fold exposure in animal. At human MRHD level, we give 25 fold to animal, and there is no PK activity. Excess, uh, ex exaggerated pharmacological activity could be used for the assessment in this case. TK um, data from pregnant animals in a GLP compliant study is expected. For biopharmaceuticals, tenth fold. For combination products, tenfold, a uh, twenty five, and biopharmaceuticals, tenfold. Maximum feasible dose can be used as well to set high dose. It works like this. Let's say we do IM. Animals have less muscle mass. So there is a limit as for the amount to put IM in animal. So we give to the max of IM allowable amount. That's maximum feasible dose endpoint. Setting high dose using MFD, you could increase the number of administration a day to maximize the exposure. Next, dose selection using limit dose endpoint. The toxicity of uh, candidate material is very low. No toxicity 
at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 milligram per kilogram. Still no toxicity. We cannot continue to increase it to 5,000, 6,000, and 7,000 because it doesn't lead us to anywhere. So the limit is set. 1,000 milligram per kilogram. That is the upper limit. So for the materials with very low toxicity, the limit of those is set at 1,000 milligram per kilogram. For lower dose levels, there is also an explanation in guideline. For lower dose, those without toxicity, that's the definition of low uh, dose. There must be no toxicity. And it's usually set between one to five fold of the human exposure at the MRHD. These are newly added information. So those selection um, section, there are many uh, very detailed explanations. So please refer to that section. Route, route of administration, the, it must be the same as clinical route. But for transdermal, sufficient exposure cannot be achieved when the absorption of the material is not done well because we need to see systemic toxicity once it's given we must be able to see how it gets delivered to baby and what kind of impact it has on the baby so with the transdermal if there's a limit in um, absorption uh, a different route uh, such as oral is required to make sure that systemic toxicity could be assessed And please read the rest of the slide. For administration schedule, how many times for um, how long? It's usually daily dosing. For bio biologic, uh, sometimes once a month. So the um, regimen in clinical study uh, must be reflected in the dosing study, but it's not always like this. Uh, you need to have a case-by-case -case approach. For combination products, it's um, daily dose. The administration route and um, dosing period, how to calculate and determine that is also explained in the guideline. For vaccines, there are vaccines only for children. That does not require DART. But for vaccines for adults and women of childbearing age, DART is required. Dosing amount is determined. It should be enough, uh, one dose, single dose, to facilitate immune response. Usually there are three different doses, but for vaccine, only one dose. For pharmaceutical products, uh, certain milligram per kilogram, but for a vaccine, the same amount uh, must be given to animal. Vaccines for a clinical study, the same dose is given to animal. One human dose equals one animal dose. And the dosing is decided uh, milligram per kilogram basis, but this is an exceptional case. So when you do the dose selection for a vaccine, um, single dose, the same dose for um, clinical studies. So one human dose 
equals one animal dose. If if uh, it's given uh, hundred is given to human, the same hundred must be given to animal. Vaccine is administered to IM. So there is a limitation of the amount, the liquid amount. Vaccines for a clinical study must be used, and the maximum value amount must be given to animal. And the exact dosing is determined case by case. When vaccine is given, maternal antibody titers and immune responses must be maintained in determining the the administration um, frequencies. For example. If three times is required, the three ti three um, uh, uh, injections must be done before mating. High antibody value must be maintained throughout the study period before mating. Enough dosing must be given to maintain a high concentration of antibody and the mating must be done at that stage. You can just read through the context here. Sometimes you make a mistake. With statistical analysis, it must be done uh, by liter. Sometimes you don't do that. In this table, this is the fetal weight. Six maternal animal from one to six. This is the mean average of fetal weight uh, for all of the mothers. So the average must be reported. By each liter, there are means. You get the average and standard deviation and do statistical analysis. Each data gets the way to do it is not the um, sum of each individual data. It has to be calculated by litter, which means um, average of the fetus from the same mother. The rest are quite common instructions for statistical analysis. What is important in the um, ART is for malformation, the frequency is very low, low. So malformation is a rare case. When it's observed, because it's a rare case, it doesn't have a statistical significance. In that case, biological significance must be assessed. Usually, if there are more than two malformations, we could see that as uh, biologically significant. A separate training session is required for that. So for t today, uh, we could stop here. And um, it's a topic for a different tra training. 
For the ART, we need to conduct a risk assessment, and that is also uh, described in the guideline. As you can see, all the data uh, need to be utilized in order to conduct a risk assessment. You can see what kind of data should be used on the slide. What is important here is that when we conduct a risk assessment, there can be some rare malformations in rat or in rabbit. Sometimes this kind of malformations can be observed, but it is really rare. And it, if it happens, even if there is no those relationship, we call it as a rare event if it happens. It is. It should be counted as important factor in risk assessment. And these are the cons uh, points to be considered in risk assessment. NOIL and MRH, the exposure levels need to be compared. This is really important. Usually, NOIL in non-clinical study and exposure at NOIL, if is lesser than 10 times of MH, uh, MRHD, then there is, there is an increased concern for developmental and reproductive toxicity. The guideline says there is a increased concern for that. Compared to MRHD, if the NOIL is more than 25 times higher, then there is a minor concern. And the most sensitive animal species, let's say you have rats and rabbit. For rat, at 100 mg per kg, there were no problems, but with rabbit, there were toxic effect or weight loss at 100 mg per kg. If that is the case, the rabbit result should be used in assessing the risk to human. If there is any weakening of fertility, and if that returns after those, it is less concern. And if there is any malformation, it is increased risk or concern. If the weight of fetus has been decreased, but you can also see the delay in the ossification, then this is less concern. But if there is no delay in the ossification with the weight loss, then that is increased concern. And if malformation is observed, but it is not that much clear whether this is actually malformation or not, there is increased variation. If that is the case, it is increased concern. Segment 1 and 2 and 3 testings are done, and the similar results are observed from those studies, then we can say that there is a strengthened concern. For example, the fetus died in the segment 2, then in the segment 3, there is a decrease in the number of the, uh, the living uh, fetus after the birth, then that is the case. And if the toxicity is also observed at the uh, segment two and three, then it is. It also means that there is a strengthened concern. So I just went over the guidelines main body. There are two annex. One is in vivo study design. The annex is very detailed. Actually, I explained a lot of them in the earlier section. So I will just move to the next. 
I didn't explain this. Usually with monkey, enhanced PPND study is done. What how we can do it is that we made the monkeys. Then G D twenty the ultrasonic evaluation is done in order to see whether the monkey is conceived or not. Then we do the dosing. EPPND study. In this EPPND study, usually the drug is antibody based drug. So only the pregnancy period is the period where the dosing is done. For rats, the dosing is done even after the parturition or and breastfeeding period. But here it's only for the pregnant period. Once for for example, once human get pregnant, the human we visit the doctor and do the ultrasonic examination to see whether the fetus is developing well or not. Likewise, we do the same using ultrasonic device to monkey. And when a baby is born, we visit the pediatric doctor to see whether the our uh, baby has an issue or not. The same examination is done to the monkey, monkey here. So EPPND here can be understood in that way. I will not go over all the details here because of the time constraint. And in designing the in vivo study, there are some options in the guideline for the fertility study and Embryo fetal development study can be combined. So the dosing is done until the implantation. And it can be extended until organogenic period is over. For rabbit, GD19. For red, GD17. Usually, the fertility testing is done with red. So GD17 is the date when we conduct the segment 2 study. Then we can combine segment 1 and segment 2 study together. So here we can conduct one study combining two studies. Let's say in general toxicity study, we confirm the toxicity in male. In that case, motility, fertility, and repeated dose toxicology study can be done together. So if the dosing period has been extended in segment one, let's say, for example, in segment one study, before mating, about two weeks would be, or four weeks, or nine weeks are all feasible for dosing for males. There is no clear guideline on it. Then how we can decide it? From the general toxicity study, if there is any uh, adverse impact on reproductive organ, then we extend the dosing period. So if that is the case, we go for about nine weeks before mating. So of the 13, uh, let's say 26 week general toxicity study or 19 week of the repeat dose study, if we conduct that, the male fertility study 
can be done together with the general toxicity study. And as you know, for the general toxicity study, for 13, we repeat those study. That's one animal per group. For 26 week study, 15 animals per group. For the ART, 16 to 20 pregnant females are recommended in the guidelines. So in general toxicity study, we have to increase the number of the male. So let's say if we have 26 week repeat dose toxicology, then the fee, uh, fee male for each group should be like more than 20, like 20 or 22. So male per group, the number should be increased. So that's, that should be considered. The revised guideline recommend this for the first time. So if we observe adverse impact on the male reproductive organ in the general toxicology study, then this combination study can be a weight. Next is the NX2, which is about alternative assays. There are many descriptions about the qualification for alternative assays. When we develop alternative assays, we have to develop, uh, to validate and qualify those assays. So we just can comply with that process. This is well defined in the annex. And what is important here is that if we want to utilize alternative assay in risk assessment, there are some conditions to be met. More than 150 women of childbearing age women are involved in the clinical trial and the kind of the clinical trial should be approved by the regulators and in the process the risk assessment involving alternative assay can be used. And here there are conditions. We can understand MOA of new drug. And if there is any clear evidence for MOA to create an issue on EFD, then we can adopt and utilize alternative assay. Or another case would be toxicity in animal species precludes attaining systemic exposures relevant to the human exposure under condition of use. However, I have never seen this kind of case. And another condition can be like we have very obscure results from the animal study. Then in that case, we can conduct the alternative assay in order to clarify it. And when we use the data for toxicity for lesser than 150 women of childbearing age for lesser than three months, let's say the later stage cancer patient or life threatening disease patient if the drug is for those patients those patients have really low possibility of pregnancy 
So if that is the case, alternative assay methodology can be adapt, uh, developed and be used. And qualification is also mentioned in the Annex 2. I think you can read it. And this will help you better understand the use of alternative assay. The alternative assay can be adopted in the DART testing. There are two conditions. One is it is expected to incur EFD toxicity. So you conduct alternative assay. So you see, then you see that there is no malformation or you are not very much clear about the result. Then you can go for the definitive study, meaning that you have to conduct a study with the animal species. Or you can you you conduct the alternative assay, then you see clearly the MEFL. Then you can clearly say that this causes malformation. But if it's not clear, if it's equivocal, you can uh, conduct the EFD in one species, and if you malformation from that then you can stop there. But if even if you conducted EFD in one animal, your, uh, the result is there is no malformation, then you go for the second species. Usually the first animal species is red. And if there is no malformation there, then you conduct a second round with rabbit. If you see the malformation or decrease the number of the born uh, baby animals, then you can say that there is a toxicity. And if there is no changes or impact, then you can say that this substance has no embryo or fatal developmental toxicity. And the second case would be life-threatening disease or late-term disease, treating drugs. In that case, it's a bit more complicated. For one species, usually red, the study is done. The alternative assay study is done on one species. And if the result is negative, then go for another species. And then the stat testing will provide you some result. But even at that case, if, if, the, if the result is so clear, then you can stop there. Let's say, however, if you conducted alternative assay, then the result is equivocal. Then you have to conduct the definitive EFD study in the second species. And if there is MEFL, then it's considered positive for MEFL. But if the result is negative, so there is no MEFL, then you go for again with the first species, but this time definitive EFT study, not alternative assay. So this is how you can do the alternative assay. 
So with that, I'd like to close my presentation. Do I have questions? Yes, thank you.